over the past days we have been going through different aspects of Satipatthana. We spent some time looking at the body because the body is the foundation for the practice. The foundation in the sense that it's where we begin and where we keep going, we keep our basis in the body. It's very important to have a clear relationship with the body. If we want to examine the mind, it's much easier and much more beneficial if we do so from the basis of a very clear connection with the body. So the body is the foundation and we stay with it all the way through the practice. We looked at Vedana. Vedana is a whole world of its own where we're looking at experience, whether physical or non-physical, from the perspective of affect. How does this move me? It's hard to put Vedana into words because it's not a specific something. It has to do with the whole realm of stimulus and response. I am touched by experience and when I am touched, I respond in some way. That realm of response is Vedana. It's the realm of affect, the realm of the heart, rather than the realm of the head, the realm of knowing. It's quite subtle and it covers everything, physical, non-physical. Yesterday we had a look at one aspect of, of contemplating the chitta, the heart-mind, when we looked at tracking the thought stream. There are many other aspects of the mind, of course, but we won't have time to go through these. So we just started with that one. We can see that the practice covers everything. It covers the body, it covers the mind, and Vedana uh, includes both. Tonight we'll talk about the four foundations in a kind of overview to get a sense of the whole picture. This morning I'd like to try something completely different. I'd like to look at Indriya Sangvada. This is a particular form of practice that the Buddha taught which is so basic he teaches it before meditation. Around the, the walls you've got some posters up about the gradual training. And if you look at those, you'll see Indriya Sangvada, the restraint of the senses, and it's something which is practiced before meditation. You find it in the suttas when the Buddha is talking about beginning a formal meditation practice. There's a standard sentence that you find. The meditator, the practitioner, goes into the forest or to the, the root of a tree or to an empty room, sits down, crosses her legs, straightens her back and establishes her mindfulness directly. And then you get the meditation. And you get the establishment of mindfulness is the beginning of the practice. And of course, this establishment of mindfulness is satipatthana that we've been talking about. But before then, you have this practice called the restraint of the senses. And it's classified as part of sila, of ethics, morality, not meditation. In the Buddha's training, if you ordained at the Buddha's time, you would be trained in the rules, in the way of life. First, obviously, you have to learn the way of life what rules to follow, and then you would be trained in the restraint of the senses, and only then would you start meditation practice. It's a foundational practice. It's even more foundational than mindfulness of body. So what we're going to do this morning is to have some exercises in this practice. And you're probably wondering why, if it's so foundational, if it's preliminary, why are we doing it in the middle of the retreat instead of towards the beginning? 
And the reason is, it's because it's actually quite difficult. At least I find it difficult. And it's a very interesting practice. Is it a preliminary practice or is it a very advanced practice? We'll find out when we do it. This is the way the Buddha talks about it. He's describing the practitioner. And he goes through each of the six senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, minding. And the same practice for each of the six senses. On seeing a form with the eye, she does not hold on to its themes and features, since if she left the eye faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states and desire and grief might invade her. She practices the way of its restraint. She guards the eye faculty. She undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, She does not hold on to its themes and features. On smelling an odour with the nose, she does not hold on to its themes and features. On tasting a flavour with the tongue, she does not hold on to its themes and features. On touching an object with the body, she does not hold on to its themes and features. On knowing a phenomenon with the mind, she does not hold on to its themes and features. Since, if she left the mind faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of desire and grief might invade her, she practices the way of its restraint. She guards the mind faculty. She undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty. So this is the description of the practice. And you notice it all revolves around our relationship to themes and features in Pali, Nimitta and Anubhyajana. What is this all about? Theme here is the general impression that we have of a sense object when we first notice it. It's that which draws us in. And then the features are the details that we start to fill out once we get drawn in. I'm sitting here in the hall and I notice it's very bright over there. So I might be drawn in by that. The theme would be the brightness and then the features would be the details of the landscape. Or I look in this direction and I'm seeing a whole number of people. This would be the theme and the features might be I might zero in on one person or look at another person or check another person. So these would be the features, the details. If you think about how seeing works. First of all, you notice how visual awareness goes out from the eyes into the landscape and grabs hold of an object and then starts to focus in on it. Let's say I'm outside doing walking meditation. Something moves and it holds my attention. So I turn to it and I look. This is the theme. Something drew me into it. And the awareness goes out to it and starts to examine it. Oh, what's that? That's a bird. That's a nice bird. That's a nice bird in an interesting tree. Isn't this quite lovely out here? And so on. I get drawn into the details and the eyes are studying the landscape. Now, I might be drawn in because I like it. It's beautiful. I might be drawn in because I don't like it. For example, I'm walking to or from the dormitory and I notice my fellow meditators and there might be someone who I particularly don't like. The eye is scanning, looking for something and then it hits this particular person. Something reminds them of something. That's the theme. It draws them in. Then the eyes go to that person. Oh, yes. She's no good. I don't like her. She makes too much noise in in the dormitory. Every time I want to use the bathroom, she's there. (laughs) Every time I want to go to the toilet, there she is. It's like I cannot escape from from this person. She's, She's stalking me all the time. Besides, in the meditation hall, she's always moving. and It distracts me. First, 
the eye will go out and be interested in something and then it will focus in and start filling out the details. And of course in that example it's also the mind. The mind recognises a response and then starts filling out the story. Blah, 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 blah. The mind works in the same way. This is how thinking often works. We're meditating, following the meditation object, and the mind is generating thought. It always does. Well, mostly. Not always, but most of the time. And these are small thought images of some sort. They might be visual images, they might be words, they might be feelings, they might be combinations, as we were talking about yesterday. And then out of all those, suddenly one of them grabs our attention. This is the, the theme. And then that immediately becomes some kind of story and we start to go in and fill out the details and chew over the story. These are the features. So we start to chew it over. He did this, then he did that. When I go back home, I'm going to do this and that and that, blah, 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 blah. blah. The senses are always registering something coming in, but the senses are active. They go out into the sense field and they look for something. They grab hold of what is interesting, the theme, and they start to fill in the details, the features. They start to chew it over. It may be because it's pleasant, it may be because it's painful, but whatever it is, that's what we do. We keep getting involved in the sense world. And this creates what the Buddha calls desire and grief, or we've translated it as longing and dejection. Remember in Satipatthana Sutta, the practitioner surrendering desire and grief for the world, surrendering longing and dejection for the world. Here the Buddha is again talking about this. It reminds us there's a close link to Satipatthana. He also talks about this is all about guarding the eye faculty, guarding the mind faculty. What guards is mindfulness. We haven't talked about the role of mindfulness as a guard, as a protector. But the Buddha talks about mindfulness in this way. So he's talking about here about mindfulness. So this is the practice of mindfulness. But so foundational that it's before Satipatthana. What would it mean to not hold on to themes and features? One way of looking at this is the practice of not holding on to themes and features would indicate a radical receptivity, a radical relaxation. We just receive the sense data, we don't get involved in it. We don't get entangled in the sense world. But nor do we cut it off. We receive it, but we don't get caught up. When I started doing meditation training, I trained in the Zen tradition and in the Tathagata. And both of them emphasised a form of sense restraint, which was basically, don't look around. Keep the eyes down. At Mahasi Centre they had a sign saying, the yogi should be like a blind person, a deaf person and a sick person. Blind, you don't look around. Deaf, you don't listen to anything. And sick, you move really slowly. It's not really very cheerful. <laughs> but still. In, in the Zen world, it was simply, don't look around. Keep the eyes down. Sense restraint, in the sense of not having sense data. Cut yourself off from the world. But in this practice, the Buddha is not talking about that. He's not saying, don't see, don't hear. He's saying, when you see, don't grab themes and features. When you hear, don't get involved with themes and features. But he's not saying, don't see, don't hear. It's quite different. So what we're going to do is to explore this practice. We're going to do it sitting. Actually, this practice is best done in daily activity. 
And I think originally that's what it would have meant, it would have been designed to be. One of the areas where the Buddha talks about it as being very important, and this is for monks and nuns, is on the arms round. When they go on the arms round, they leave their special world in the monastery and they go out into the lay world, the world of the big city, the big town, where there's all this stuff happening and they could easily, if they're not careful, get sucked back into that world. And this is when they must guard the senses. It's very important. This is primarily a daily activity practice. But here we're going to do an artificial experiment in it, in the sitting posture. What I want you to do is to sit in your meditation posture, but do not meditate. And this includes keep your eyes open. If you normally meditate with your eyes closed, do not close your eyes. Keep them open. So, I'm saying do not meditate. Just sit there, but don't meditate. Okay? So if you get into your posture... And sitting with the eyes open. And relax. Just relax. And feel the whole body. Don't focus on any particular part of the body. Just feel the whole body. Don't do anything at all. Just sit. When you feel awareness moving forward to an object, to do something with it, relax. Don't do, just be. Relax. Don't do anything. Are you seeing? Bring awareness to the eyes. 
relax the eyes. Receive sights. When you find awareness moving forward to look at something, relax. Come back to the eyes. Don't look, just see. Hearing. Bring awareness to the ears. Relax the ears. Receive sounds. When you find awareness, moving forward to listen to something. Relax. Come back to the ears. Don't listen, just hear. Are you thinking? Bring awareness to the mind. Relax the mind. Receive thoughts. When you find awareness moving forward to think something, relax. Come back to the mind. Don't think, just know that there are thoughts.
was that? Did you manage to see without looking, to hear without listening, and to know that there's thoughts without thinking? Did you manage to not do anything? There's one bit of nodding there. <laughs> What's nice? Relaxed or what? Yeah, relaxed and you are not involved in them in peace. Okay, so relaxed. So you weren't there was something you were not doing which you normally do. Would that be right? So you had a sense of not grabbing at anything. That was relaxing. Yeah. Anybody else? How did you find it? Was it easy or difficult to not do anything? easy to let go of seeing but not to let go of hearing because there was too much sound, it was too aggressive, what, all that building noise. What about thinking? What happened for a moment? You, did you say that it stopped for a moment? That was clear. It had the effect that you stopped thinking for a moment, but then you just kept thinking as, as usual. Yeah? This practice is, as you can see, it's extremely simple. But precisely because it's very simple, it can be very difficult. One thing that you know, might notice when you start doing this is the strong habit to do something that the eyes really want to go out and look, the ears really want to go out and listen, and the mind really wants to work at thinking about something. One way of doing this is to become sensitive to the doing. That when you notice that you are doing something, relax. It's not a prohibition. It's not, don't do that. It's on. I'm working, I'll relax. Thinking this is too much effort, I'll relax. Looking at this is too much work, I'll relax. And it's also a bringing awareness to the sense sensitivity itself. Bringing awareness away from what you're seeing to the eyes. Away from the sound, the construction site, to the ears, away from the thought and the world of thought to the mind itself. Radically simple and r radically relaxed, not doing anything at all. As I said, I think it's best to practice this during daily activity. In daily activity, you've got something to do. I have to walk from here to there. I have to eat this meal. I have to sweep this floor. I have to wash this body. I just do that, and I don't do anything else. I don't add any extra work. I just relax here. Yeah. You bring your awareness to the center, to where you're receiving the sense data, the eyes, ears, etc., and you feel you're ignoring something. I suspect this is because it feels artificial. 
you might be holding yourself back rather than relaxing. Maybe. So you're turning this into some kind of special doing and if you're doing this, you, can't, you must be ignoring something else. Keep playing with it. Uh, it's, it's very unfamiliar and it feels very artificial but keep practicing. Keep, just, keep, just play with it and see how it goes. It's not ignoring anything. It's receiving everything. If I ignore something, that's extra work. But this is relaxing. If you find you're ignoring something, oh, I'm working, I'll just relax. We relax the sense sensitivity. So we relax the eyes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When you relax the eyes, you bring the awareness here to the eyes. When you relax the ears, you bring the awareness here to the ears. You're also getting data through the body, so you relax the body because you're getting information here. And of course, you relax the mind, and that can be trickiest because where is it? <laughs> So when you relax with the eyes open, you just shut down, you get bored. I shut, yeah, I'm so bored, I just shut down. I don't want to know anything. I don't want to hear, I don't want to see. It comes, but I don't care. I really don't care. Sit there and do nothing. So when you say you're bored, do you mean that you, you don't care to get involved? I don't want to get involved. You don't want to get involved? No, it's happening. It's so annoying. Is that boredom? Indifference? indifference maybe, it could be close to boredom or indifference. There is a... It's certainly it's not getting involved. It's not our habitual relationship. Usually we get involved. And if I were not getting involved, then there must be some sort of problem. I must be bored or indifferent or whatever. But this is different. This is a not getting involved, but a receptivity. I'm receiving, so I'm not shutting down, I'm actually opening up. Take for example with seeing, if I'm getting involved visually with you, we're having this conversation, so I'm focused on you, this means I am ignoring everyone else, doesn't it? Because I'm focused on you. But if I'm simply receiving the data, I'm not ignoring anyone. I'm open to everything. I think maybe it's because the mind is so so um, trained into engagement. Yes. The minute you decide not to get engaged in it, the system just it, 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 it has no interest. The mind is in the habit of being engaged with things, going out to and getting engaged with things. And so as soon as you stop that, it's going against all that habit, and it's like the mind registers this as I'm not interested, and like it's time to shut down. Mm, something, like something like that, yeah. Mm. It, it goes against all our habits. And this is what makes it quite radical. Normally, we get caught up in themes and features. We've been doing that all our lives. And suddenly, the Buddha is saying, No, just don't do it. Just relax. Don't get caught up. Continue to see, but don't look. So when you practice this, you find it either overtly pleasurable or sometimes it's completely neutral, but underneath the neutrality you notice know subtle pleasure, a sense of ease. I think this is uh, what the Buddha is looking for, this sense of ease. It's like cruising through the world, not stumbling over everything but just allowing everything to be, allowing it to come and go without interfering. 
Some of you are practicing open awareness. And this would be very similar, wouldn't it? I find it's a good base. As I say, I think it's best in daily activity. A good base, and from that base, you can then go and do a meditation practice. Come back to this open receptivity, relaxation, and then go and do a meditation practice. Come back. And it may be different meditation practices. And you come back to this base. And in daily life, every now and sometimes you have to do. Like you have to get involved. You have this as a base, and then you go out, get involved, work, 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 come back and relax. And then go out. Something needs to be done. You do it, you come back, you relax. And I think this is how the Buddha meant it to be used. It's kind of a, a place to be at home with. And in this place, the basic work of Satipatthana, of tracking experience as it unfolds, just becomes second nature. It just becomes obvious. But you notice that we we waited until now to do this. My instinct is always to wait until people are already settled before introducing this. Uh, in some uh, practices, they do this at the very beginning. Teachers who do this find it satisfactory. I would include um, Syed or Utejaniya in this category. He seems to think it's this kind of practice is great for beginners, and I, I just scratch my head and think, God, if I was a beginner, I'd spend months in complete confusion <laughs> trying to work out what was going on. <laughs> so I'm much more conservative in my approach. And so I like to actually give people something definite to do, do this, watch rising and falling of the abdomen, and then later on, oh, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> But if you want to do it, you can do it. <laughs> so it's different ways of approaching the practice, different ways of doing the practice, different ways of teaching the practice. Some people find this kind of approach completely natural, like they would jump into it, like into water, and start swimming. Other people are completely confused, just don't know what's going on, and they just want something to do. I'm one of those people. You know, when I started to learn meditation, I just wanted to be told what to do, that's all. <laughs> It also depends on the person. So some people would find this, this open awareness, this restraint of the senses, a very natural thing and they just go into it. Other people would find it a bit weird and it's very, quite difficult and they might try it a bit, but basically they want something to do. So, you know, instead of walking through the, the campus being open and restraining the senses, they'll be walking through going, walking, walking. Seeing, seeing, walking, hearing, walking. Something to do, something to do, something to do. It depends on the person. And also it depends on the time. Sometimes one style of practice seems to work. Sometimes another seems to work. So um, this is something to play with and experiment with. <laughs>